You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Welcome to the show. I am Brian Call, and I am joined in studio by Brad Hunt. And today's podcast is with Tyler Strohmeyer. We were in Kodiak with Adam Weatherby and the Weatherby crew. If you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend it. It's not a waste of your time. You're going to enjoy it. There's a part one and a part two. And on that hunt, Brad and I are pursuing this mega megasaurus buck. (laughs) And you can see him in his full glory, running up and down the hills and doing his thing. We got in close uh, a number of times, and Adam Weatherby got a stud buck. This particular Megasaurus, though, eluded us by the time we had to go, and so we never got him. Well, we put our videos up on YouTube and showed them to the world, and... About a week later, I get this message (laughs) that says, hey, I killed your guys' buck, (laughs) and I'm like, dude... I'm like heartbroken, but I'm stoked for you at the same time. And so we had an introduction and we met Tyler Strohmeyer. Yes. So Tyler graciously agreed to come onto the podcast and um, he shared his story. And I was curious. He got there right after we left and got on the same buck and he walked us through through his uh, his experience on Kodiak. Yeah. I think you're going to really enjoy this show. Uh, Tyler's just a down to earth, uh, cool dude. And him and his guys, his buddies, he tells the experience. There's some photos. If you're listening to the podcast, just go watch the intro and you can see pictures of his buck and some of the other bucks that they took on this trip. But um, again, when you can interview and talk to people who were successful on a hunt on big deer, I'm just curious, how'd you do it? Where was he? How did it turn out? And I'm also, I'm excited that he got the buck right? because it's getting to be an older buck. And I, I, I like the closure. I like to know and to see it. I wasn't going to be back there. Cause I doubt we're back there next year to go pursue him again. Yeah, and you're like, what, what does he really look like? Yeah. This buck is special. A Kodiak, uh, Sitka blacktail special in the sense that he, he kind of splays out and he has super long tines and he looks more like a Kansas whitetail than he does. Yeah. Your typical He's got that mule deerish look. Yeah. That coos deer kind of look is much more usually or mule, uh, Kodiak, uh, blacktail is much more curved, compact, compact short tines, maybe decent beams, but yep. this is a, this one's kind of bucks the, uh, the, the norm. They're also not usually, more than two points, two and a half or right. three, like not like this. This is full on big old points. He's a big boy. Big splits. Yes. Cool, cool buck. Happy for Tyler. Glad he came on the podcast. If you like the show, leave us a comment. We appreciate those on the YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to our channel. And if you want to learn to bear hunt or get better at bear hunting or just come and hang out with us, uh, we have a seminar that we're doing, a tour. A bear we're calling it the Western Bear Hunting bear Tour. Bear Hunting Tour. We're going to three different states and we're going to put on a a multi-day seminar basically you can get all the details for the event by going to westernbeartour.com that's westernbeartour.com check that out and if you need some supplements for your joints for your health reduce inflammation you need some bone broth protein if you need some electrolytes CBD cbd gummies go check out stealthy hunter stealthy nutrition they got it dialed over there Use the code GRITTY and uh, start paying attention to your health. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the show. All right, folks. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call, and my guest today is Tyler Strohmeyer. And in an odd twist of events, uh, we ran into each other on Kodiak Island just as we were leaving with Adam Weatherby and crew. You were coming to the island, kind of where we were at. And that big buck that we were after, we never gave him a name, Brad. Uh, we, we thought about it, but he's just a big three, um, which the, you know, a lot of people are wondering if we ever got that buck and we didn't, we came close. We could have, we were trying to get it on film, never could. And the thing is, I just wanted to see the buck. I like hands on it. You know how it is? Like you're out there hunting and you're after a giant, even if you don't get the giant, you just want to see it. And the odds that 
it lives through another winter and all the challenges that are out there get slimmer and slimmer. You know, they only got so many like winners in them. Yeah. And so um, I was like, will that buck live another year? Will we ever see him or you just die one of those ghosts? But yeah. didn't happen because you killed him oh, after man. we left. Yeah. So I wanted to do a little podcast uh, and uh, get your get your story on it. So first of all, before we do that, though, tell folks a little bit about who you are. Tyler Strohmeyer. Yeah. So uh, I'm a lineman for the power company here in Idaho. Um the couple guys I went with went with three other guys here from Idaho. Um, one guy I worked with uh, previously, also a lineman. I went with his dad and uncle. So pretty good little group. A lot of, you know, Western hunting experience there. I mean, um, so we all kind of hunt the same, you know, or similar style. So pretty good little group. Um, yeah, I how, live in. And how old are you? Uh, I'm 35. 35. Yeah. And, uh, and you were born and raised in Idaho? No, I'm a transplant. We can't really talk about where I came from. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been here uh, about eight years. So okay, very yeah. cool. Yep. Okay, so uh, you you head up there to Kodiak, and um, we had heard from the fellas that were there before us. It was a yeah. really tough hunt, you know, and the grass, the brush. It was especially thick this year. Even uh, the fellas that we we talked to said you know, they've been there, some of them like 18, 20 years, and they've never seen it like that. Yeah. Have you been there before? No, that was my first Alaska hunt. Um, I'd been to fish uh, on the Kenai Peninsula before, but never hunted. Um, Jordan and his family, they've done a few like DIY moose hunts. Huh. Um, so logistics, you know, he knew more of that. Um, I was learning as I went. I didn't know what to expect from terrain or, you know, thickness or any of that. I watched all the YouTube videos I could find, you know, just like everyone else. And I was like, cool. looks like it's going to be, you know, wide open, you know, with some brush, but like yeah. totally different than I expected yeah. as far as the thickness and the terrain. Yeah. So, um, just to give people a little backstory on how we got in touch, uh, we killed that. We didn't get that buck, but we published the first video on yeah. our, uh, YouTube channel, the first Kodiak film we did. And you can see your buck running around right there yeah, yeah. uh what did you think when you saw that oh that was cool man that's why i had to reach out because i'm like oh there he is you know i could see him like and i was showing my buddies at work i'm like that's that's the buck that's the one i got and they're like and, you know that's pretty cool plus your your photo or video quality is so high that it was like really cool because we got a few videos through the you know little spotter and stuff but they're not great you know but i did get him on the hoof a few times at like 800 yards you know it was just cool raking a tree and he d he made the slip on us a few times before we got you know actually got in on it too, pretty similar to the same story that you guys had. Oh so, man, I yeah. I want to get into that story because, um, we the first day he was right there at like two two fifty, and Adam was waiting for us to climb out of the tree we were in yeah. so he could shoot it, yeah. and we were up in the tree dinking around. Um, we were we'd never been there before, you know, yeah. day yeah. one turned out our best opportunity was the first day the no oh. wind bucks were out sun was shining and you know we had our chances but adam we none of us wanted to shoot too far and we figured hey man if it's this good on day one yeah yeah we Little passed on some studs too that we other oh. bucks i'd be happy to have taken we were like nah, nah that buck is only like 150 yards up the hill as soon as he drops he's he's in range we're real comfortable be patient and what you don't know actually is that was happening. Buck was just, we were just sitting there waiting and that buck was going to come down. We were going to, we were going to smoke him and there yeah. were other bucks rutting and we we're like, he just, he's just going to spin down. Adam was ready, but the other Weatherby crew with Tyler and JD and those guys, they had shot their buck. Well, they decided instead of coming back to the bay, the way they had come, yeah. they cut right through our spot where we were. Gotcha. And so yeah. they came to within about 50, 60 yards of the buck yeah. and he ran off with all these does and all the deer shifted like 300 yards to our, to our left. Yeah. And we were like, Oh man, what happened? What happened? This was this close. Uh -huh. Well, they spooked them. And so then they're like, Oh crap, we're waving them off. We have like orange, yeah. like we're waving with orange glassing pads and stuff. So they back out and they're like, dang it. And so they, that but that ruined it for that day when we were like this close and 
the next day we had him again, but he just moved through the opening so quick yeah. and then tucked away. And we weren't sure we should go after him, stay. Mm-hmm. And uh, we ended up moving to the left and we tracked him. But for some reason, when we got up there, we got on the Buck Adams shot instead. Like they were both right there somewhere. It just so happened that Adams is the one that presented. And that was a terrible day for the wind. And and then yeah. the next day we went up there, Brad had him at 140. And he gave us the slip mm-hmm. uh, because I was trying to get the camera on him and Brad passed on him and didn't shoot. He's waiting for the camera and then he got away. And at that point I was mad at Brad because he didn't shoot. <laughs> and I'm like, you should have shot him anyways. It wouldn't have been on camera. I don't care. So we yeah. had this argument right there, a little a meltdown. Yeah, Next day tough. we got up there, saw him just briefly, couldn't get him, saw him again, couldn't get him. And uh, I, I left a little bit bitter. Uh, just because we had, usually when we put our mind to it, we're going to get one, we're going to get that one. And, uh, so walk me through what happened day by day for you. Um, you know, when you guys decided to head up in there, uh, and you found them and all that, tell me how it went down. Yeah. So I'll start with, uh, when we got off the plane there at the airstrip, we met you guys and I, I recognized you and Adam looked real familiar and he goes, Hey guys, I'm Adam. And I'm like, Oh. I know who that is now. That's Adam Weatherby. And I was like, cool. You know, like some of the other guys kind of look familiar, but I figured, you know, that's your group. And we we're, you know, the guys were talking to you and you told us about the big, you know, there was, you said there's a big one out there and that's about all you said, you know, and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, like who knows how far did they go? Where'd they go? There's all these different spots we could hunt, you know, that we kind of had scouted or we learned at the lodge, like, this is where we can drop you. Um, you just got to pick, you know? And uh, so First day, uh, we picked that same spot, I think, where you guys went or similar, you know. We ended up on that same hillside yeah. and um kind of more to the north, it's real brushy and thick. And being Idaho guys or you know, hunting Idaho, it's brushy, you know, at times, but there's there's a lot of open ground too. Yeah. In between there. And um, you know, steep, but sometimes open. And so I think Jordan had spotted that buck and I never saw him the first day. Um, and we were, you know, three, probably 300 yards kind of from that, where that hillside really sloped up. And, you know, he said it it was a big one disappeared in those alders and that thick stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, let's just go after him. You know, like, uh, let's try to get up there and see what we can see. Well, I totally underestimated how thick it was. (laughs) And I, I was the guy packing the bow around, which looking back, like the weather and everything we had, how tall the brush was, no snow. It was like, it was tough. I packed that thing around for four days. I never once had a stock. Uh, it was just, I was just beating it up the whole time. I felt bad, but anyway, it's so we uh, go up the hill. Let's go talk ahead. about that just for a second. Uh, yeah. We, we're going on a bow hunt here real soon for coos deer in j- January. And we're dedicated to trying to do this with a bow yeah. and it's going to be a fun hunt, but Kodiak is even, it's almost uh ambush hunting requirement like you don't get to just sneak around through the bush and spot and stalk because you're, it's just too noisy it's too thick there's too much like in the desert yes it's quiet but you can get a little wind kicking up a little yeah. cover noise but there's yeah. nothing except the sound of your feet yeah. like kind of rustling the dirt a little bit you can really push through in in kodiak man it was like you can't sneak around at all no, those, uh, I don't know, those thorny sticks that stick up and you're just, you know, swimming through them and they're just crunching. And we got about 20 yards up the hill and we we're like, what are we doing? But we just kept going because we were committed at that point, you know, got up same elevation as where that buck was. And of course we couldn't find anything, you know, he either just ducked off in the alders or, or completely made the slip on us and we never found him. Yeah. That day. So, you know, you and you, I think I, I did, if I remember right, you asked me about the bow. Yeah. When you landed, yeah. can, can, can yeah. we do this with a bow? And I think I, if, if it wasn't you, what I was saying was I've been to parts of Kodiak Yeah, and you can see it on some guys hunt films, like Timbernet solo hunter. He's done a uh-huh. few, he did some with yeah. uh, Austin and uh, it's real grassy and yeah. rolling Hills and tundra ish. And dude, it was like walking on, silent sponges and yeah. open country and i've been there but the bay this area not like that at all no and may- maybe if there was snow and they were you know down next to the beach and 
yeah. you could kind of set some trails and ambush them. You know, maybe it would have been a little more doable. But uh, it's those a tough bow. It was and, tough. And I had mentioned this. I'm like, yeah, if you had 15 or 20 days, yeah, to just poke around and keep yeah. grinding, you can do it with a bow and shoot a giant for sure. You might have yeah. to figure out a pattern where they come through, be set up yeah. for that. You know, it's certainly um, it would be a fun and challenging and rewarding bow hunt to go on. But when you got the limited days and you're, you know, you're just going up for a hunt like this, um, that's where I'm like, yeah, the rifle presents enough of a challenge and a reward that uh, it's all right. I, I, I can do that and, and get a lot out of it. So you, you kind of figure that out you still carried it for four days though <laughs> well yeah and that's the thing like i knew my buddy i could just use his gun and which was kind of sucked because i knew i was going to fall back on that probably yeah. eventually if i failed uh but at the same time i was okay shooting with a rifle i just figured i might as well bring it you know yeah. you never know right. can't shoot with a bow if you don't have a bow so exactly and you might yeah. sit there and have one come out at like 30 yards and you're like dude yeah i can yeah. smoke this with a bow right now but exactly. i didn't bring it yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of stories of these uh, sick of blacktails just walking right up to you. You know, that's why I was like, got to have it. You know, we'll see. Yes. But so yeah. he gave you the slip on the first day. But yeah. did you ever see see him? Yeah. So, so first day, uh, just quick glimpse, disappeared completely. Couldn't find him. Got up there, found a doe bedded, a couple more deer. Day kind of ran out. You know, we made our loop back to the beach. Um, second day, uh, and the first day, so we had four guys in our in our little group, and we split up two guys, two guys. They made a big loop, um, and then we were up on that hillside, and we looked down, and there's a big meadow down there in the middle of the kind of brushy yeah. timber. And so we're we're looking down, and we could see two guys in the edge of the meadow, and we're way up on that ridge, you know, fifteen hundred feet up or whatever, kind of above the thick stuff. And we look down, there's two guys, and we're like, oh, we rec- that, those are our guys, you know, and yeah. Then we look across the meadow and there's two, it looked like two bucks, one buck for sure. Like, a you know, a solid mature buck. And they looked like they were maybe 150 yards away from them, but that meadow kind of just rolled over and we're like, they probably can't see them, you know? And, uh, eventually we watched them and they made a little move towards the buck and they got, it looked like maybe a hundred yards. And then those bucks ran off, you know, like, and they, they had told us later, they got a quick glimpse of them, but that was it. Um, so we knew where they were at at that point and, you know, it was getting dark. So we, we just made our way out of there. So, so that was day one of hunting day two. We went to the same spot, all four of us, cause we're like, okay, there's mature bucks in here. Let's go to that meadow, work our way to the hillside. Maybe we'll catch one down in the flat, you know, in that big meadow. Yeah. Didn't pan out. It's kind of funny. So, um, you can't, it's the visibility was tough. Um, I actually climbed a tree on the edge of that meadow, probably only yeah. 15 feet up. And my buddies were making fun of me, taking pictures of it, you know, just like you guys. And I'm like, oh, I was on to something. Yeah. It worked for you guys. I didn't see anything, but you guys did. We saw a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That really so, helped us figure out the lay of the land. But dude, yeah. those trees are the mm-hmm. softest, most breakable, dangerous trees to climb yeah. I've ever climbed yeah. in. And, you know, and like a guy could probably do that, like just like do the tree saddle or something like that or some kind of tree stand and probably be successful. Um, well, especially, I got this little doe decoy that i was mm-hmm. packing around you know something like that might have worked but i just i didn't spend enough time doing it to you could it's so different than most kodiak hunts where it is kind of spot yeah. and stalk through some grass or you're calling them in you're rattling or calling or grunting and they come charging in which is what i've experienced before uh they were totally bow hunting friendly country on kodiak there's spots built for that yeah it's just that this area it, yeah. it, it's not really now if it was how they've described it in the past and and the vegetation is a lot more knocked down and less intense and the ground is soft and wet enough i suppose it could be better but you mentioned the tree stand thing we where i found that big shed and where i saw um uh trails and stuff you could be in a tree 20 feet up and we we saw a buck go by there a couple of times when yeah. uh when the snow when the wind came it pushed them low. And then when the wind would die down, they, the next day they'd go back up, but yeah. they were low. They were really low when the winds were just ripping, they would drop low or they'd hit these pockets like where Adams was. And that's one of the things about it is, you know, spot and stock. These deer, our experience was when the storms hit, the deer went deep into cover. Yeah. And so even though you could use the cover noise 
from the storm mm-hmm. for stalking. It's not like they're bedded in the open. No. You know? So it's just a tall order, man, with a bow. Uh, they, they were bedded in like an alder tunnel, pretty much, yeah. from what we saw, you know. Yep. And you might just catch the glimpse of their of the white on their ears or their throat patch, and that's like it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was. Um, so I guess that back to that second day, we made a loop to that the back of that same hillside. And in the afternoon, and we and that's when we caught it, caught that buck again. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was just so late in the day, and he was eight eight fifty up on that hill, and uh, we were trying to figure out a way to get up there. But like by the time we would have made a move, we wouldn't have got in range, type of deal. Right. We didn't want to blow them out of there. We weren't sure really at that point if they were like mule deer, if they were going to blow out, you know, to another canyon yeah. or yeah. or ridge, or if they just if that's their home range which it kind of turned out like that's just where he lived right at that elevation strip. It seemed like it was the same yeah. as you guys saw. Same for us. Like there was a little assessment we were doing, like how far yeah. do these deer push? Where do uh-huh. they go? Yeah. Not far. We, we no, could go up really. there, bl- bumble around, make all this noise, leave our scent, come back the next day. And they were right there in the same spot. Yeah. And even, even when they pushed out, you know, they'd run away. They'd come back like an hour later to the same spot. So they weren't really that spooked by people. No. In our experience or the scent of people, they no. just would duck away and come back later. Yeah. It seemed like they relied on camouflage a lot more than scent or anything else. They just dip away. Yeah. Um, you could see and, why, and, dude, look how thick that is. Yeah. And they're not it, being it, hunted by lions or wolves. No. Either. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we got it in that video. He moved. That was the other thing we couldn't make a move because he was moving so fast but he was just cruising, you know, he wasn't running. He was just cruising, sniffing, smelled the dough, just kept cruising, raked some alders. You know, he moved 500 yards in a matter of minutes. And we're like, man, by the time we get up where we think he's at, he might be somewhere totally different. And then it gets dark, you know? Yeah. So we, that day we decided not to talk, not to make a move, figure maybe something will come out lower shootable and you know, nothing did. Um, so that ended day two and we, you know, four guys, we still don't have no shots, no, <laughs> right. no close encounters really. And, and so like, it was kind of getting stressful a little bit, you know, like yeah, being my first trip to Alaska, it was like, I don't want to come back a failure. You know, like yeah. my wife is, she's like, you better come back with something. I'm like, I, I, I will. Yeah. Yeah. So you're fighting the weather or has it been pretty good so far? Um, It was pretty nice. As far as wind goes, it was cold. It was in the twenties. Uh, just real brisk, you know, and it's kind of humid there. Um, so just cold, but yeah, not terrible. Wind wasn't bad. Um, so let me think. So day three, we had to, we we kind of felt like we were spinning our wheels in, in that spot. So we're like, let's check out another spot. Maybe there's some open country that's a little more conducive to you know spot and you know spot and stock type stuff or get within range, you know, like shootable distances. And um, so we picked a different spot. Um, we split up again. Or no, sorry, we stayed together. All four of us went to this other spot, hiked up this, you know, 1,500 feet up, and it was a lot more open, super glassable. There's a frozen lake, and, uh, you know, right off the bat, we're, we're in them, you know, a long ways off, but we could see a couple bucks over here on this knob and get up to this other glass and knob, like typical Idaho glass and type stuff, you know. Yeah. And then there's a couple more deer, and, and they're just kind of popping out everywhere. And then, then we were kind of making a plan on, on how to hunt them at that point or which ones to go after, you know? Um, and so we sat down on a, we we're all together still. It was about, you know, getting to be about time to eat 11 or so. So we're kind of snacking, glassing. And, uh, Ben, um, one guy was with us. He's like, he saw a buck, but he couldn't tell how big it was. And then it just disappeared, um, below us like 400 yards or so. And so, uh, He's like, I know he's there somewhere. Well, he's just sat there and waited him out pretty much because no one else saw him, but he saw him. Well, and then like two hours later, this buck just gets up and just starts running, like gets out of bed, just starts sprinting after a doe and he's hot pursuit. And so we're like, oh, we scrambling to get on him. And we never talked about who was shooting first or anything. You know, three guys yeah. had rifles. So it was like a scramble, like who's going to shoot? Uh, somebody, somebody better get ready. <laughs> Yeah. And so Ben's like, all right, I'll do, you know, he spotted it. So he gets on the gun and, um, now we're all trying to get on it together. I was trying to fit, you know, video through my spotter and that buck's 200 yards, you know, across the Creek over here. And now he's 300 yards back this way, just running. And you can't hardly find him in the scope, you know, when they're moving that fast and we're trying to tell him where he went and it was just a scramble. 
<laughs> and um, so he, and he ended up getting a shot. And it was about 450 yards downhill. Made it, dropped him. Good shot. And then uh, so we get down there, and it was a big, nice, big two point, real wide. Like I, I don't know how wide, but wider than any of the other bucks we saw. There's some so pretty. Cool. Yeah, there's some heavy older yeah. two point box around there. It's, he was real cool, real dark, uh, you know, skull cap. And uh, yeah. so now we're on the board, you know, like the pressure's yeah. off a little bit because it yeah. was kind of getting a little stressful. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. So, okay. uh, so, so that was in a different area. And, and yeah. what was your assessment after that? Like area yeah. to area, what was your thoughts? Um, that area was really cool just because you could see so far. Um, and you could cover, cover country a little easier, not quite so brushy once you got up a, you know, a certain elevation and there's a ton of country that we didn't even cover. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back there, but you know, with weather and stuff, you could only get to certain areas with the boat that's on certain days. And so I don't know if we would, we could have gone back to that spot again after, Mm -hmm. I don't think it was really an option after that. Um, so yeah, he got that buck down. We all get down there, take care of it. And we're getting ready to uh, hike out. And uh, we had seen a brown bear way down in this valley on a frozen pond earlier in the day. And he disappeared, you know, like three quarters of a mile down there, disappeared, disappeared in the brush. And, you know, whatever, it's cool to see him that far away and not right up on us. I got a cool video of him walking across a frozen pond and, uh, you know, not too big of a deal because it was so open, you know? Yeah. And then, so we're hiking out and I look up above us on this little rocky knob and I'm like, what is that? I'm talking to Jordan's dad and, and he's like, I don't know. And so I pull out my binos. I'm like, that's the bear. He's right above us. And it was, it was like a thousand yards and he was just standing up on the rocks, just watching us. And then he just laid down, laid his head down and just watched us walk away. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Cause he knew the game, you know, like right. it was the shots. He knows what's down there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that yeah, was Cody a, X, Cody was X cool. a different place. huh? Yeah. It was cool. You know, and like, it wasn't really a close encounter at all, but it was cool to see him, you know, and like just be part of it. No, he's there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So we packed out of there, got back and, you know, we're on the board and, um, so let's see. So day four, uh, we went to a whole different spot. Uh, we split up again and I think, uh, Jordan's dad and uncle, they went fishing and, uh, yeah. I decided not to, I told him out like, I'm here to hunt this. I can, I can buy fish at the store. You know, like <laughs> right. that's what I told him. Like, that's this what is I said I, too. Yeah. This is what I, and I love fishing, you know, like, yeah, it would have been too. Awesome, but I wanted to, I wanted to get some hunts in, you know, get some something in, you know, like at least yeah. stocks or opportunities or whatever, see more bucks. So, um, so me and Jordan went out and it, it got real windy that day. Um, the typical, you know, walk up get all sweaty and then get up top and it's just blasting wind. Um, oh, sat to blast. Those are tough conditions, man. It, yeah. We just kind of tucked away and in, in a, you know, a little, little ravine deal and just try to stay out of the wind for a bit and glass and saw a few deer. It was pretty slow. Saw a few other guys that came up from somewhere else, like cross Canyon. So kind of took the fun out of that spot, you know, cause we were basically blasting across there. Um, so we made a big loop. Those guys walked to the back and then just turned around and left. Um, and so we made a big loop around this and then it, it like died off in the afternoon. The wind did. And it was like real, got real nice, which was kind of surprising. Um, and then we had this big flat um, kind of back towards the beach. And uh, there was a few does in there that we had seen earlier, but we made a big loop around and kind of ended back up in there. And then um, pretty much just bucks started to pop out in the, in the mid afternoon couple here you know just a few here a few there and then um jordan spotted it was like a just a solid super symmetrical three point with eye guards you know like cool buck mature buck and so it was like all right game on and uh again running just popped out of nowhere just running does back and forth fast as he could like full sprint and then um so the problem we had there was uh getting a range on him because there was no there was no landmarks for reference you know, your, your yellow grass patch to red bush to alders, you know, like, so we're like, I, I think he's 500. Now he's, I don't know, 450. And so he finally got a shot right, like right before dark. And so he got that one down. And so we got, we got two on the board and we're like feeling pretty good. Now we're figuring it out. Yeah. 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 That's, 
that's the thing. I felt like uh, on short days like that, you get a few that play play well. You 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 get into some deer, yeah. but it would have been nice to have a little bit of a longer range setup because yeah. once you get on their level on the same hillside, like yeah. the buck we were after, you can't see anything. Yeah, and so to be set up where we were, where, where you could see the whole hill, often his elevation marker was just a little bit. It was like 200 yards, a little above. Like Adam wanted to be, we kind of wanted to be around 300 yards or so. Yeah, yeah. And we we could go out to four with if the wind wasn't too bad. But we pretty much had bad wind all the days except the first. Yeah, like real that's, bad crosswind. So uh, we kind of were. I was like, man. And so when we did catch the buck low. We just, I didn't, dude, it was pouring rain and I, yeah. I never do this. I never take my camera and put it in my backpack. Never. Yeah. But in Alaska, I've done it a couple of times because the rain is coming down so hard. On, it's going to break the camera. Like yeah. it can hold a lot. Uh, it can withstand a lot of moisture, but sometimes not that much. And the microphones would, would stop working. It yeah. sometimes the camera will still work, but the microphone ports are done. They just yeah. don't work. So I was like, Brad, I'm going to put it in my backpack. Once we get to the foot of the hill, I'll take it out, you know, because we're probably not going to run into one in this thick brush on the way there. And so that thing was in my backpack and we had just got to the foot of the hill and I was just getting ready to get it out. I should have pulled it out a hundred yards sooner yeah, or even, even at 300 yards. I, mm-hmm. And so I made that fatal mistake of not having the, the it out, but that was the one time really where they were real low. Yeah, and uh, the rest of the time they were high, and so I felt like we watched that buck. We could have shot him at five or six hundred, like every day, if we yeah. had just been willing to take a sh- shot that far. And with like a three hundred weather beat, I would have felt comfortable. Even yeah. the three thirty eight that we've used, but that one twenty four hammer and that little six five, I was mm-hmm. like, oh man, we. And Adam was talking about the hold off for the wind, and mm-hmm. it was it was like three feet on on uh some of those and i'm like yeah this is not going to work this is too light of a setup for this condition and so being able to poke out a little distance um on kodiak it's sort of like some of the places we've hunted bears there's so much terrain and there's so much cliffage out there you know i don't know if that's a word but you know what i mean like it's straight down straight up to get to the other side or to close distance it's gonna take all day but if you can just be more proficient with your rifle an extra 100 or 200 yards beyond what you normally shoot it yeah. opens up a whole world of success for you how comfortable how far were you comfortable shooting um he, so jordan's rifle which i was using he it's a it was a 65 prc um so you know pretty similar caliber he was shooting i think a 143 so a little heavier um probably do a little better in the wind but i'm not super trained on on judging windage or any of that so you know after listening to you guys and seeing that it kind of made me think like that's probably something a guy should just practice, you know, even on his own or get some professional training at one of, you know, at one of those courses. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 500, you know, 500 with a good rest in, um, you know, low wind was, was pretty reasonable. For yeah, for sure. Okay. So you guys, uh, you got this buck and, uh, cool. pretty, pretty stoked with that. You got two on the board. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just a super symmetrical three point with good eye guard. So it was cool. He was stoked. Um, we did the pack out in the dark, like you guys did, you know, and, uh, so that day it had warmed up a little bit in the afternoon and that ground was like kind of frozen, but then it warmed up and there was like a layer of mud on top. And so coming off the edge down back towards the beach, it was just, just slimy. Yeah. Yeah. And it it was just two of us. So we had, you know, everything all, you know, the deer and all our day stuff. And my bow still just crashing it through the brush. Yeah. And uh, we fell, you know, 10, 15 times coming out of there. It was miserable. Brad brought the uh, Catula micro spikes. Yeah, that would have been handy. We, we, uh, mine, I, I didn't know. I loaned them to my brother and he, mm. he broke them. And so I didn't know I didn't have a pair. And no. as I pack in like just two days before, cause I waited to the last second, I didn't have them. We get there. Brad's the only one with them. And they're the, they're such a, a, a key piece of equipment for that kind of experience. So he was crushing it, hiking out with, uh, Adam's buck. Adam fell like slippy slided down the mountain a couple of times. And one time he fell and almost went off a ledge, like yeah. straight down. It would have been, yeah. been bad, 
but Brad yeah. grabbed the horns on his pack or something and, and held them up. Um, but yeah, those micro spikes are a must for for Alaska. Yeah, I uh, I had some and I uh, was hunting mule deer last December in our late season, and I lost one in the snow and I you know couldn't find it, and so I had one and I thought about bringing it and I was like, nah. I should have just brought it. It would have been handy yeah. just to have one. Just to have one. I've I noticed didn't... too, like we've used other brands. They don't work well. The Catula yeah. is the one. But one other thing that we've done, I don't lose them when I wear them like my big wild rock type insulated boot, but I've had them slip off when I wear a kind of a more tennis shoe type boot yeah. in the snow, like like you're experiencing. I've I've lost one doing yeah. that. I've had them come off a couple of times, had to go back and find it in the tracks. But if you take your gator and you put it over the spike, that mm-hmm. little the little uh y- the little strap, yeah, keeps you from ever losing the micro spike. Oh, that's a good tip. Yeah, those would have been handy. Trekking poles, of course, you know those are like a, a given for us nowadays. Just like you guys, and we had the sissy sticks too. Those things are awesome. So you get this buck out. Nobody broke a leg. No, nothing's no, <laughs> no, we're, yeah. And it, you know, you know, it is, you know, your buddy falls and the first thing, first thing is like, you're, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh, but he's just keeps sliding, you know? So like, <laughs> Oh, it's actually right. getting kind of scary now, yeah. but, uh, there was enough, you know, trees and alders that he was going to stop. There was no cliff. So, um, so we get, you know, we get out, we, we, uh, in reach the guys and let them know we're going to be late, you know, and yeah. they could see us coming off the mountain in our headlamps, you know? Um, yeah. so we got that out and that was, that's cool. So now, so now I've got two down, two tags out of four. Things are, you know, feeling a little bit better about stuff, figuring it How out. How many and, um, days do you have left to get it done? So that was day four. So two more days yeah. of hunting. It's a short yeah, hunt, then, dude, especially if you get yeah, weather. It is. And if you want to yeah. go chase, do some fishing, which is legit, yeah. or chase some ducks, you know, you kind of want to experience it all. Yeah. It's. Yeah. That was the, so that was the entry. pressure? Yeah, oh, yeah. Pressure? Yeah. That's actually me. Yeah, you know, and I've got young kids, and they if I come back with nothing, they're like, they don't know why, you know, they're like, you're hey, a failure. When I was there, I was like, <laughs> I was like, Brad, I've, I've, I'm blessed. I, I'm like 49 now. I'm going on 50. Mm. I've, I've got to go and do tons of stuff the last 10 years, especially of my life. So if I'm like, I don't feel pressure anymore. But I do remember when I went on my first expensive sort of, yeah, like budget like adventure hunt, and I'm like. I, I want to come home with some, I, I want to, yeah. I, that's the experience you're looking for. There's no, like I get it fast forward to yeah. now. And I, I get as much excitement over seeing Adam and Brad tag out than myself. I'm like, you guys go. And then once yeah. you're tagged out, I'll step up if there's time and get myself a deer. But I just get excited about any big deer going down at this stage. It's not yeah. about who shoots it. It's just collectively. And the thing that I think is super cool here is I got all this footage of this buck for days. I have even more. I haven't shown anybody yet, but I'm like, I wanted to see it. I wanted somebody to get it. And so when I saw your pictures, I'm like, hell yeah, I was stoked. Well, exactly. Like you said, we had seen him, you know, Jordan seen him twice. I saw him once real good. Um, So so yeah, so we'll just go on to day five. So now it's kind of like Jordan's tags filled. I'm like, all right, I'm hanging up the bow. It's staying in the lodge. Uh, things are getting serious now. So we split up again and um, me and Jordan went together, kind of hit that. We went back to that same area. Um, some of the other places were off, off the, not not an option because of the weather and the wind yeah. and the, the tides and whatnot. Uh, so I'm like, all right, well, I know there's mature bucks in there. There was some in the meadow. There's that one on the hill. You know, I don't know how we're going to hunt him, but they're in there. So let's, let's try that again. Um, so same thing. We kind of beat feet over that hillside and, and set up. And this was probably the worst weather uh, we had. It just started raining. And so we just got over to this little glass, you know, it was kind of, there was a few rolling hills before the base of the big hill. And so we set up on one of those and just got it tucked under a tree and just waited out the rain, you know, and then, um, soon as the rain stopped, doe pops out and then just buck hot on her tail, little buck, but they run by a hundred, 150 yards away. And we're like, okay, game on, you know, like yeah. stuff's moving now. And, um, and then, so we get, uh, you know, 
get kind of set up to like be ready to shoot and glassing and whatever. And then another buck kind of comes down the hill, pretty solid buck, um, probably, probably 400 yards. And he's coming down kind of angling towards us. And so now I'm trying to scramble to get ready. Scope's all fogged up because all the rain right. I tried to lay down. Yeah. I tried to lay down prone on the backpack. Couldn't get a good angle. Uh, you know, the typical story. And then he just kind of worked out of view. So we're like, okay, well, that's fine. He wasn't spooked. We know, he was probably going where that doe went or something. Um, so we went that direction thinking maybe we'll, we'll cut him off and, and catch him on one of those little finger ridges and, uh, you know, kind of just, just still hunting through and we, we never saw him. He, he disappeared. Don't know where he went. And, um, so now we're kind of back square one. Like we don't know where anything's at. Like, let's just go back to finding them. And so we made a, made a loop set up again, glass some more. And then Jordan spotted that. Uh, what he thought was the the big buck up up in the alders looked like bedded couldn't really tell it was so thick you know like could definitely see a, a buck though so i'm like i'm more like uh let's just go after him that's my mentality you know and he's yeah. a little more methodical which is a good balance at times you know like because he kind of makes me s- slow down a little bit but i'm like you know what we've been patient on this buck twice yeah. really and it didn't nothing panned out. He's not coming down to an elevation we can shoot. Yep. Um, we have to get up there somehow. And so we yep. picked a little finger ridge we could go up and, uh, and it was kind of like tall yellow grass on top of it. So we knew it wasn't going to be super thick to where we couldn't see from. And we kind of ranged those points to know how far we would be from the spot where we saw him. And uh, everything just lined up. We got up there, took our time super slow, tried to be as quiet as possible got up there and I couldn't really tell, but it looked like he had stood up cause I could see more of him or maybe just the vantage point where we were was better. Um, you know, up another couple hundred feet elevation. Yeah. Um, and so set up and he had those, uh, uh, the little, I think quick sticks, they clip your, uh, yeah. trekking poles together. Yeah. So he had a set of those. So I got set up, which those are awesome too. So um, handy. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in that tall grass and brush. So I got set up and I think it was about 150 yards and all I could see was just neck up and throat patch. And so I'm like, that's good enough. You know, (laughs) so dumped him right there and still didn't really know, you know, how big he was. I knew he had that big fork on his, on his right side and I knew he had eye guards. I figured he was a three point, you know, but still like, you don't really know it 800 yards through a spotter. And so I finally saw him, you know up close when we got to him and it was like holy cow this thing is this is this is awesome (laughs) yeah oh dude just like you he is um i haven't seen did you see any other bucks that were of that caliber when you were there um no and we never saw anything with four uh like adam's buck um that was yeah by far like the longest tines and everything um on the last day uh jordan's dad danny he got a buck so i can go into that two later but um it was just a super heavy three by three with eye guards like real mature but a little more compact frame than this buck this buck was kind of like a like a columbia blacktail or a mule deer frame almost you know right um and n- not really like the rest of the deer we had seen yeah that's what i was so, saying in the the ending of the last episode we dropped on the yeah. kodiak part two i was like yeah that shed brad can you hand me that shed brad's here in the office i I, you know, this, this shed I found, and I think this is more typical of the sort of yeah. mature, uh, Kodiak that you find buck yeah. heavy, you know, lots of mass down in here, um, down and, and just stubby, but not tine length. This is, this is a stud mature, yeah, heck heavy yeah. horned, like super thick. I, I showed uh, folks on that video, um, the difference between a big, like, even if you took, you know, um, the big buck that that uh Ryan shot the coos it doesn't have this kind of mass and it's got mass for days i got this one up uh in uh the mountains of idaho right and you can see yeah. um how bladed that is uh-huh. just this this shed that i found and then you can see how bladed it is right there at yeah. the top but when you look at this uh the mass here you know on these bases you know, yeah. this, this Sitka is right. It's bigger. It's, it's yeah. almost uh bigger, bigger mass, or at least 
very similar in in that that size range um and yet you know tiny deer where this is a big mule deer big old mule deer and this yeah. is this this antler is just mass no tine length not much to it uh and mm-hmm. and that's what that i think a lot of these big heavy uh kodiak uh, uh sitka blacktails are like and i'm i'm stoked with a mature buck like this but when i saw Love that it. buck i'm like this does not this is unique in the in the sense that most he looks more like uh, some of those big Colombian blacktails I have on my wall. Much yeah, more that, like tiny. That one there. Yeah. Columbia blacktail. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was just different. You know, diff- you know, I don't know score wise. I didn't score him, but yeah. Just cool. You know, either way, just cool. So I just I got I, him on the when I saw Go your ahead. pictures uh and stuff, I'm like, yeah, man, he had that tine length. Just the frame is so big. You, yeah. One of the things I, I said to Brad when we were there, I'm like, when it comes to Sitka blacktail or even coos deer, I really do like to get keep the cape and mount it simply because yeah. without perspective of the, mm-hmm. the, the, the that Sitka blacktail's head and body and ears, it's hard to appreciate how big the rack is in comparison. Yeah. Uh, same with well, the coos yeah. deer. It just looks like a young, heavy... Uh-huh like three-year-old whitetail buck if you don't have it yeah. mounted on the coos body yeah and the the sick of blacktail they're just so pretty too with the the throat patches and their colors you know they're just unbelievably pretty so i was actually good I, my plan was just to euro whatever i got and then after seeing him i'm like i can't i have to mount this thing he's just too pretty their capes like, uh, i have a few colombian blacktails yeah. that i shot when i grew up in oregon and they're mounted and it's just the reason is it just they're gorgeous the head yeah. the cape the shape you know so yeah that's that's what i love yeah yeah i was kind of blown away getting them on the ground and seeing them up close and holding them and then you know the background the beautiful background with the bay and the big valley back there i'm like this is unreal like this you know this trip is just at that point it was just unbelievable you know yeah so. Yeah, it's a special tri- special place and I'm I'm glad you guys uh you got that buck. It sounds like you guys had a great trip. Um it looks like you were 4 for 4, which is great. I think um looking back um I'm I'm glad to have seen it. A few years ago there was that brow tines buck that I didn't shoot when I was with Lampers and an, a guy shot him later like 2 months later. Uh, or a month and a half later or so in that year and i got to see it on the ground which just made me more sick that i even passed on it the first time uh but it's just nice to see uh, a mature animal like that that's special like harvested instead of sort of disappear like i said like a goat yeah yeah i mean it's a bummer because he did die you know you know he's not there but at the same time like you know what happened to him you know so yeah it's kind of cool and you got to see an up close picture like that was totally different than what he looked like at a distance too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what were your thoughts uh, now that you got your hands on him? Like, um, he is a big buck. Yeah. That's, that's where I kind of knew like this, this has to be mounted, you know, like this is, this is something special, a lot more than I had originally thought or even dreamed of, you know, like I was looking for a mature buck, but I wasn't going to hold out on, you know, the yeah. biggest one. Um, so it, it blew me away and, and honestly, you know, packing the bow around forced me into having the patience to not shoot uh, a younger buck, you know. So in a way, it worked out really well for me. You know, we got some of the other ones out of the way. And I'm like, okay, that was worked out good. I didn't plan it like that, but it worked out. Right. right. So, yeah, whenever uh, an animal gets away like that, I always think to myself nowadays, I'm like, a lot of times I end up shooting something bigger. So let's yeah. uh, not get too, too hurt over those sorts of, yep. you know, things that turn out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how the guys in the past, I was kind of bummed when I found out it was only one tag. Um, Cause when we had booked this, it was, I didn't know that. I thought we could get three still. Yeah. Um, when I found out, I'm like, you know, that's a bummer. Like I'd at least want to try to kill two, you know, get one out of the way and then, and then look for a big one. Right. Um but honestly, like the amount of work involved, uh, taking care of them afterwards and all that stuff, even with, you know, four guys splitting up and 
you know, butchering and stuff, getting it all, getting it all wrapped up and frozen. Like it, it was a lot. If you'd have killed three a piece or two a piece, you'd be up till midnight every night, just taking care of animals. And that would have been stressful, even more stressful. Well, and having been there with some guys that have hunted there for 10 years or longer, the population, yeah. you know, goes up and down and yeah. it sounded like not only were the conditions rough this year, trying to just pull one out of there because it was so thick but you also have to deal with like the population uh winter kill up and down they're not the same year to year and i think there yeah. is more demand to go on a sick of blacktail hunt than there used to be as guys learn to appreciate that as a as a good adventure mm-hmm. and, a, and a rewarding hunt and so i'm fine with them doing the one animal i think it's it causes you to be you know a little more selective if if there is that kind of demand for the hunt I mean, yeah. it used to be they had it. They were they couldn't give away enough. When I first went to Prince of Wales, yeah. they wanted they gave away four tags. You could shoot four bucks. I mean, they were just drowning in bucks, um, and nobody did the hunt. But now, you know, it's more well known, and and people are interested in it. It's the information age. There's more people that can go do it. I'm just grateful that it exists. That there is that hunt. Yeah. That you can have an adventure like that. It's every bit of any kind of adventure you could go anywhere it's a great species and i don't think it gets the recognition that it deserves i think it's just a cool cool animal and a cool hunt yeah super cool so much character too all the bucks were different you know in their own own little ways the bladed back tines you know that's kind of standard on a lot of them but like all just so different but you know very similar in in some ways too yeah every buck from in our camp and there was like four of them uh, four out of six, I think, is what we got, and every buck in camp was unique, very unique. When I look back at some other pictures that were taken in the past, I only saw a co- out of like probably forty pit photos. I only saw like one or two that had frames like the buck you shot. Yeah, um, out of multiple years, tons and tons of hunters, I, I only saw like maybe two that looked like that had frames like that. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer to take that out of the gene pool, but hopefully he got some breeding in before, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know how old he is. They say on Kodiak they live to be like 15. They can. Wow, really? Mm-hmm. Wow. I was doing some digging, but definitely they're at that 10-year mark. Um, What was the average lifespan? Maybe I got that wrong. Maybe it's 10 years, but still a lot longer than your average uh, lower 48 yeah. deer. Like they live huh. a good long time. Yeah. yeah i think the guys at the lodge you know they estimated off of just his head color and his teeth probably like a four and a half is is kind of what they said but who knows you know i guess that could be different you know yeah i don't know years. i mean he could be a young stud right yeah. in there I mean, yeah so i th- like i said on that last episode that last film we did seems like they get to their frame size and then after that they just add mass yeah yeah every year it's just mass it's just a little bit heavier than it was the year before so mass wise how did it shake out because i know it's got the time length in the frame how did it do for mass uh pretty solid like i said i didn't score him but he was just just solid all the way out um not as heavy as danny's that he killed on the last day but still just right there with all the other bucks we had seen with mass yeah but he's just his time length was so long it almost made it look like he wasn't you know well, the thing is, is look at all the growth that had to go into time length. Exactly. Yeah. Right. When you have that kind of thing going on, yeah. you know, you, you end up with that kind of scenario, you know? Yeah. So yep. yeah, dude, I'm happy for you. I, I, um, I figured, uh, when I see a lot of these, like my coos deer, for example, has a lot of inches. Yeah. Uh, they're just a little less mass. You know, because that overall bone growth, it's got to go somewhere. Yeah. And of course, you get those freaks that have both the length and the mass. Uh, and that's pretty cool. But yeah. um, yeah, that that's just a cool buck, man. Yeah, that's uh, next on the list. That's coos and uh, I need a white tail. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see what kind of adventure I can find after this. The It'll... color on those horns, by the yeah. way. What do you think of that? 
Oh, that was just awesome. You know, rubbing those alders and that, that red brush or whatever. It was, yeah, just cool. Just yeah. Cool. Adam's buck was heavy. It yeah. was real heavy. And, and we saw him on the first day skylined and all you saw was points, like little yeah. points. Cause he wasn't quite super wide, just, just outside yeah. his ears and stuff. But, um, yeah, on yours, it's interesting because there's so much width, so much, so much time length. Yeah. Um, it made me wonder how he would score all in all. I kind of looked at him and thought he, he was heavy for his, he was heavy, but yeah. he wasn't like, going to be known for just mass yeah. you know yeah. different kind of yeah you know i'm kind of i'm not a score guy really but i am kind of curious you know because i don't know it is kind of a fun game but i am kind of curious but he, he's at the taxidermist so i'll know i guess when i get him back yeah you have so to, you'll have to get it give us a ballpark i was curious too because you throw you hear people throw out numbers all the time and when mm -hmm. i shot my coos deer in arizona I was like, I don't know. And Ryan shot his last year and we both shot big bucks. And I'm like, is this a hundred inch? Is this 110? Yeah. Is Ryan's yeah. 120? Is it 115? Is it 105? Like we had no idea. We didn't really yeah. care in terms of we were both stoked, but I did care in terms of, I want to sort of know what those numbers mean when people throw them out. Yeah, exactly. What to like, compare. Yeah. And to know, okay, if, if this buck was, you know, 118, like yeah. like with Ryan's, then you know, I think mine was like one ten or something. Like when you kill, what does that mean? Like yeah. how big is that? And so I think it's uh, really cool to to you know have that. And I think Brad's was right around a hundred or something. Is that right? One of right at a hundred. And you're like, yeah. and you kind of look at Brad's, then you look at mine, and it's like they're both almost the same, really, except mine's heavier yeah you know it just has that m a little bit more age to it and a little bit longer time like a half inch on every time yeah. it gives you another like five inches oh, real yeah. quick you know yeah. so it's kind of fun i mean it's, it's all part of the experience i guess uh because yeah. i'm i really do enjoy trying to find those old animals those unicorns right like yeah that, that was definitely one of them you know it, he kind of had his range that at least you know when we were there and he stayed there and he knew he could, you know, slip out either way and stay in those alders and still rut those right there. So he wasn't, when we were there, he wasn't going anywhere else. So just had to get in there on him and make it happen. How close was he to the area where we were filming him? Could you recognize it? Yeah. Um, very close. Yeah. It looked like, uh, North, South, um, like I said, he was probably eight eight fifty from the bottom of where that ridge, the mountain yeah. side he started. Liked, that's his elevation, man. That's what he liked. Yeah, and uh, he was when I when I shot him, he was more to the uh, I guess it'd be the the south. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the south of that uh, ridge. So I guess so. There was a creek, a, a bigger creek that came off that hillside, a little stream, um, and he was above that. Okay. I don't know if you if you remember or if you went up yep. there at all, but yep, we did. Yeah. So that kind of funny when we were going in, uh, we had to cross that, but it had frozen over. Yeah. Um, and Jordan just slipped out and was just sliding down to the top of this creek. And it was again like I'm laughing, but I'm like, well, I don't know if he's gonna stop. Yeah. He finally did. So he's like crawling on his hands and knees to get up. And I'm like, all right, let's keep going. You know, we got yeah. we got business to take care of. Yeah. So when we came back out, he's like, I know how to get across this now. So we came out the same spot with the buck and he just got down on his hands and knees and crossed, you know, crawled across it and it worked. Yeah. But you couldn't stand on it. It was just like a luge. Yeah. Uh Brad was up on a slope and I had just walked down it and I'm like, dude, this is like a it's probably 80 yards, 90 yards to the bottom to, to the alder brush, but it's just a open grassy kind of mud slope, but it's steep. Yeah. And I walk by and I'm like, be careful. And I turn around and I, and I'm walking down. And I, I turn and I look back and Brad's gone and I'm <laughs> looking up the hill. I'm like, where's Brad? Where's Brad? And I look all the way down to the bottom because I'm trying to figure out where he was. And I yeah. saw that in the time I had turned my back, he had gone halfway down the, <laughs> down this mountain, probably. 50 or 60 yards going full speed, just, just yeah. sliding, nothing you can do about it. And then, uh, he hit, no. he hit the, uh, he alders there as it got to the bottom and stopped him. He didn't get hurt, but you could very easily. 
And it just like yeah. that that rain and snow combo because we had snow and then it would melt and then it would snow and it would melt yeah. and that in between slushy phase. So, so do you think you'll do you think you'll go back uh, with the bow to Kodiak? Do you want to? You still have that bucket list item, or you, you did you scratch that? I don't know. List? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the scenario, I guess. I'd love to take it again, yeah, you know, especially if other guys got rifles. But with that backup plan, it's it's awful tough to just commit to just the bow, you know. So different circumstances. I love stocking things, you know. Um, different circumstances, I would have you know, probably have more stocks and different terrain, stuff like that. So I don't know if I went and, and that's what I kind of wondered when I showed up. I'm like, why all these films, most of the guys that are even bow guys, they take rifles. Well, you, uh, know, yeah, you, you guys too, you know? Yeah. You know how you have your, I shot one with a bow with Cole Kramer. Didn't yeah. get really good video of it. Uh, I shot one with a rifle, one with a bow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there was a lot of spot and stock opportunities back then in, in the more open tundra country. And it does yeah. appeal to me for an, a great bow hunt. Yeah. Um, and if you look at like Nathan Endicott, some of his films that they did on Kodiak or even Tim Burnett, um, they were in much more grassy open terrain. And I think some of it, you know, I talked to some guys, it's like, well, the deer density is five times what it was like this year when we were there or 10 times yeah. what it was. Well, when you have that many deer and the density is that high, it's a great bow hunt. I just think it, yeah. it it depends year to year. Now, if you really want to do it with a bow, you could do it every year with a bow. It's just that you're going to have a lot harder time getting it done. It depends on how many days yeah. you have to dedicate to it. Um, exactly. I feel like there are other hunts that are tailor-made for bow hunting yeah. and and some that are are less so. But yeah, I was looking at I was looking at the bow hunt option. Now we went with Adam. So yeah, we, it was, I go, Adam, do you think I could bring my bow? He's like, no, Brian, <laughs> no, it's not a weather bee bow. <laughs> it's not, you gotta be shooting around. I was like, okay, fine, yeah. fine. Cause I, I really have stepped up the archery, uh, hunting this year and going forward. I'm, I'm really, that's really what I want to spend a lot more time doing. So, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I still, am going to get a few rifle hunts in that are just, mm -hmm. There's just hunts that are like the moose hunt we did this last year. Yeah. It's it's a do it yourself. I can I can manage it just barely budget wise. You know, it's not a break the bank, but it's you got like a six or seven day window, eight day window, yeah. and yeah. then you got your travel and logistics and trying mm -hmm. to do it with a bow. And it's not the rut. It's 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 different timing. It's like okay, well, I have plenty of adventure with the rifle for that. And some of the late season mule deer, same thing. I, I don't need a bow for some, when I only see five bucks the whole trip Yeah, on a 10 day trip, I don't need to try it with a bow. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it would, it would have been plenty fulfilling just strictly rifle, you know, like it was a great adventure without yeah. the bow, you know, we so. got the duck hunt while we were there. That was pretty amazing. What was it? Yeah. yeah it looked cool. It. Did it both on the boat and then we did it both and we did it on the bank as well on the shoreline. Yeah. And, uh, it was pretty amazing. So yeah. what, uh, what would you do differently going back? Oh man. Um, definitely the micro spikes. Uh, I definitely bring those puffy pants. I, I, I don't know. I misplaced them. So I didn't have any, I had rain pants and, and just regular pants, which worked fine. But on those cold days, that was a little rough, you know? Yeah. Puppy pants would have been pretty cool. Um, as far as gear goes, man, differently. I don't know. It played out great. Like, like I said, having the, the bow to make me be patient. Um, the first few days, I'm not very patient. So like that was, <laughs> yeah. that was key for me. I want to go after everything, right. you know? Um, and then just learning their behavior took a few days for us, you know, knowing what we could get away with and not, uh, knowing that scent wasn't that big of a deal the wind direction really didn't seem like that big of a deal at times um you know just just how we hunted it just evolved as we went so i don't know i don't know that i do anything different yeah. explore more areas you know go a little farther try to go a little little past where maybe everyone else was going which you know can be hard to do nowadays because everyone's pretty prepared you know yeah it seems like uh being in a little better shape would have helped, you know. What do you think about 
my Dude. idea was spike camping. Yeah. That could have changed everything. Cause I'm like looking at it. We're efficient with teepees and wood stoves. And I'm like, man, if we could just, yep. just park up here yeah. and stay for a day or two without having to drop and go all the way back to the bay and all the way back up. That was rough. It both, it has its pros and cons, right? Yeah. Yeah. It would have been, it would have been rough as far as sleeping in those conditions, but um, yeah, you'd be able to hit that like three to six mile range that no one's hardly anyone's seeing, you know, we never got there, you know, two miles about up or two and a half up and, you know, two and a half back to the beach is all we were doing about, you know, in a couple thousand feet or 1500 feet up. So there's this whole, you know, you look, you get up high and you look at back in those valleys, you could see for 20, 30 miles. And like, that's what I just sat there and imagined like, very few people are going back there. There's probably huge bucks, you know, that yeah. no one sees. What do you think uh, about ranking this hunt to other Western hunts you've been on? Yeah. On the adventure scale, the cost, the reward, all, you know, put the whole thing together. What is a hunt like this? Like, say a guy is out there and he's weighing out all the different hunts that might be on the table for him, you know, in the next five years. As far yeah. as this hunt goes, I mean, how does it rank on like on a one to 10 for compared to other hunts you could have d gone to do instead? Yeah. Where does it rank out for you? Um, super high. I, a, a sick of blacktail has been, always been a dream. You know, I've, I've hunted blacktail, Columbia blacktail. So it's kind of always been on the list um, for me. Yeah, super high. I don't know that I could replace it. It would be different, you know. Yeah. But like uh, actual money spent. Near the top. Um, yo, yeah, it was awesome. Um, you know, if a guy were to travel from the Midwest or whatever to come out here, you know, he's going to spend about the same amount of money traveling and taking care of any uh, as going to Alaska and flying there and paying to get everything back, you know. And I've never done a lodge hunt. So being able to come back and have good food every night and somewhere warm, uh, that was a cool little different for me, you know, like were you Jordan too. Yeah, at Foxtail. Yeah, and uh, Jerry, the food it was ridiculous. Good. It was yeah. like restaurant better than restaurant. Like the seafood was ridiculous. Oh, it was so good. Yeah, and that was cool. You know, getting to eat local stuff too. And yeah, um, yeah, it, and it was like it's an all around hunt too, or all in around adventure because you can go out and take a day off and go fish and not Good hike time. your butt off. You know. Yeah. So, and then if you're into ducks too, there was that. I just we didn't have time. More more time would have been awesome. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think um, my my really my only wish is that it could be a little bit longer. You know, yeah, we went yeah. just just attack on a little more time. Yeah. Um, when you uh, that's good. I I was curious. Um, you know, when you compare it, I say this all the time. There's there's Prince of Wales uh, hunting bears or going southeast Alaska for bears there's there's the adventure of um sitka blacktail in august on prince of wells island which i've done which is pretty spectacular and if you want to do a bow hunt in velvet dude that's like bachelor herds of 10 bucks and, and that was an epic hunt and i and that was totally spot in stock and you could stack yeah. up trying to do that though hard horn during the rut in prince of wells not my cup of tea right. that looks like uh that that i've heard it's a tough hunt now, if you fast forward and you jump into, um, I tell people like Kodiak Island or even just moose, I've, I've done a moose float hunt and now I've done like a moose lake hunt and we're going to try another one. I'm just like exploring over the counter opportunities, general tags in Alaska. And you were talking about a guy could come out here, Wyoming or Montana or Idaho or something and hunt elk or go on a deer hunt. And what he's going to pay to get there versus what he'd pay to go to Alaska, man, yeah. there are some, even for black bear, you know, you can hunt like, you can kill like two black bear sometimes or more, um, in some States, including some spots, I think in Alaska as a non-resident and you look at the cost of the tags and so on, like guys don't think about to me over the counter type Alaskan adventures, they keep thinking Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. Yep. And the truth is the costs aren't that much different to go to Alaska for a lot of this stuff. There's so much cool opportunity up there. And, um, we're just finding 
it's amazing to to do that. Same with Mexico. Like that's another yeah. kind of creative place to go. That's an adventure. And New Zealand for tar and stag yeah. and that kind of thing. There's I've heard I've never been to to hunt axis deer, but that's another one in a few places from Texas to Hawaii where it's like you yeah. can go and have some really ad- high adventure stuff. But cost wise, I I would argue like sick of blacktail adventure to expense. It's one of the lower, yeah. lower ones on the list with the highest uh, reward, you know, like up there. Now you are going to get wet and it is going to be cold and you are going to have to fight the elements in a way that you don't when you go to, I don't know. It, it's a question, right? If yeah. you went to Mexico or something, um, yeah. which has a different challenge, but I loved it, man. I'm with you. I think yeah. it's um, it was it's awesome. a great adventure. Great adventure. Yep. Well, dude, yep. thanks, Tyler, for coming on the podcast. I appreciate that. Yeah. You got to keep me posted. Having... When the mount is done, I got to see it, brother. I got to see yeah, that. I'll thing. send you a picture. And, uh, maybe I'll send you a picture. I don't know if you saw. I'll, I'll send you a picture of all four bucks, too, so you can yeah, kind of see it. them all. Side by side, we're all holding them at the in front of the lodge. So Do that. Send me what whatever you got. I'd love to take a look at it. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'd like to share it to the audience. Yeah. I'll put it in the podcast. Put, put some photos okay. in there and and maybe put some posts up as well, kind of showing that buck. A lot of guys that were in the comments, you know, I had uh, some friends like Corey Ford at Angry Spike. He's like, did you get that buck? I got to see that buck. I'm like, I didn't get him, but another guy did. He's like, what? Yeah. So I got to show a, off. Here's a yeah. yeah, I got to yeah, show go ahead. off That's, your buck. It's so. on social media. You know, I got it on my on my stuff. So yeah, share it with whoever. I don't, I don't care. And uh, right now, people so, that are listening, if they want to find your social media, what is it? Uh, it's uh, so Instagram's just two stro two s t r o. It's just it's just me. It's no big deal. Just a normal guy, you know. Yep. yep. I don't, can see. The I don't put out. There. Yeah, but the yeah, I got a few pictures up, and I'll probably post more. I I don't know. I just I just, I keep <laughs> thinking about it, and I I go back and I look at them, and I'm like kind of being selfish and saving it for myself, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I need to share more and, and kind of put them out there because that's how I connect with family and friends that, you know, maybe have never been on these types of hunts or yeah, want to know about them, you know? So. No, I think it's, I just think it's cool that I got so much footage of him and then to yeah. have some closure and to see him. I love it. I love that you can look at the video too and you can be like, dude, that, that is the deer I shot. And you just like, doing his thing he never stood yeah. still that buck never stood still he's like uh-huh. running back and forth he circled that one buck you see him like strutting and kind of pushing yeah. him off and that buck's a stud too and yet yeah, that was a good he's buck. a lot bigger still yet you know yeah. and uh yeah it, yeah that was the cool that was the year. tough part about getting on them was they just wouldn't stay still when they were up and when they were down they were in the alders um and it seemed like there was a timeline where they just disappear in the alders, probably bedded. And then like two in the afternoon, they just pop up and it was like rut time or something. You know, I don't know. So yeah, I think that they he would go and check mark his uh, scrapes, yeah. his rubs. Because yeah. we saw him make a circuit multiple times and hit some some licking branches. They're very whitetail-ish. Um is what yeah. we saw. Um, neat. a lot more than a than like a mule deer would be. A lot more like a whitetail or even yeah. a Colombian blacktail. I've seen them pattern like that a little more so man what a cool hunt so yeah thanks dude appreciate you joining and uh folks thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode stay gritty